Dozens of hopeful teenagers have to deal with the gut-wrenching pain of rejection at draft time each year. Few will prove the doubters more comprehensively wrong than Paul Couch did during the 1980s and 90s. Welcome, Couchy. Thanks, Mike. You should have been a Fitzroy player, shouldn't you? Well, that were zoned to Fitzroy, uh, the hand, leg and winnable. And, uh, yeah, I should have been there. 83, I played a few practice matches, played well. Uh, I think 82, I played another game or two and played very well. But the organisation, there wasn't any. <laughs> and uh, one bloke said, oh, one recruiter said, well, go and see your mother and father. That was the end of 83. And uh, we'll have a chat in about for you to come down. Well, they never turned up. When uh, you're a teenager and your dream is to play league football and it's suddenly taken away from you, how do you feel? Um, well, I wasn't too worried about it, Mike, because I'd been used to it all my life. You know, with um, playing schoolboys, playing under-17 Celtics Cup, you know, I got the best player one game at Mortlake. They never made the first round. And the mm. bloke I played on, he got in. And I actually beat him. I just had to concentrate on my farm farm work, mm. just do that and hopefully one day somebody might pick me up. So the cats come knocking uh, yeah. and you play there. It was, a, it was a bittersweet relationship at Geelong, wasn't it? I mean, outstanding in terms of your games played, winning the Brownlow medal, 18 finals, four grand finals, but no flag. And it was interesting in those days, I had no involvement in getting signed up with Geelong. My father had a meeting with... Um, uh, Bill McMaster out in the kitchen table mm -hmm. and I was sitting in the lounge and didn't hear a word. Then um, he said, oh, we've just, you've signed with Geelong. I said, well, that's great. Did Bill walk in with a Gladstone bag <laughs> <laughs> uh, full of folding stuff? Actually, there was no money. No money? No money at all. Couchy, which was the one that got away of the four? There was 89, 92, 94 and 95. Is there one that still burns inside you about the, that you perhaps should have won? Yeah, I've got over it a bit, the four grand finals, but 89, we really didn't know what we are doing. We, um, when we won the preliminary final, you know, everybody went out and had a few drinks like we did every other week, enjoyed each other's company, and we just went out to play in 89. Probably we were more set in 92. We had a few injuries um, going into the, the, the final. Uh, Brunsey had a pretty checkered preparation, mm -hmm. and I thought we were ready in 92. So that was probably the one that really got away on us. Yeah, 92, 94, uh, we just weren't good enough. And 95, we played probably the best side all year. Yeah, that's in Carlton in 95. Oh, Carlton were yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. They were a great side. Let's just go back to 89. You ended up beaten by six points, but I think most of us who saw that game thought that Hawthorne always looked like they had control. Do you agree with that? Oh, we went the knuckle too early. Did you? Yeah, we had, I think, put gave about five or six foot yeah, kicks away. Yeah, that's right. And I said to him at, uh, in ten minutes in, I said, look, just calm down, Butter. You know, we need to concentrate and let's get the ball. Well, <laughs> his eyes were spinning in his head. He didn't even know what he was... He didn't even know I'd said it. Honestly, he was just completely out of it. And... Um, so I thought, oh, geez, we might be in trouble here. But mm. we certainly worked ourselves um, back into it. And I said to Gazza, I didn't know how many goals Gazza had kicked. I said, because the game was just full on. We just went for it. And that's how you had to play. Again, in finals, you just got to go for it. And if you're the best side in the day, well, you know, good luck and you win it. And I said to Gazza after the game, I'll turn around him, because he had a great final series. Mm -hmm. I sort of turned him and said, Gazza, how many goals did you kick? I thought he kicked one. One? Yeah, I thought he kicked one because you're, you're on the... You're, you're, you're on eight the... shy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the interesting stat about that game was that Hawthorne led by six goals at every change. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that, no. And you, yet you pegged it back to one goal in the finish. It's regarded as probably the best of the grand finals of the modern era. Difficult to, uh, to judge that when you're playing it. It is, yeah. But we had, you know, Hawthorne crawl and foul about, you know, that we went too hard at him. Mm. You know, Dipper, you know, Gazza cleaned him up. They had seven or eight injuries. Well, but the we had... went through dirt. Yeah, at, at that's the... right. Yeah. Well, he probably deserved it. Because <laughs> <laughs> he used to get you off the ball a bit, Dermy. He yeah. wasn't... Uh, he, look, he was probably the, one of the better players I've played against. Tell me about your mind shit running out. Did you go out thinking that you guys were going to attack the Hawks? Physically? Oh, we had to because we were pretty meek and mild against Essen in the first qualifying final. We had to be, you know, earn respect. Um, my... Uh, mindset was, I've just got to go out there and play and do the best I can. Because I'd won the Brownlow on the Monday, mm -hmm. I trained the Tuesday and uh, I was terrible. I thought, yeah. that, you know, I had to be the best player, which I, you know, Blighty said, you've been the best player for the last 24 or 5 weeks. This week's different. So, and I was, Tuesday night was terrible and I thought, if I go with that mindset of 
think I've got to be the best, I'm going to play terrible. Mm -hmm. So I switched all the radio, TV off, and just relaxed for the whole week and do the best I could. The Friday night, I think I had about two hours sleep because you're up and about, yep. you know, you want to do the best you can. and you're. So you couldn't sleep? No, I was, no. I was adrenaline, you know, mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. pure adrenaline, Mike. You were at the Brownlow, weren't you, that year? Yeah, 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 no, um, you know, Buddha was uh, racing ahead, he had 13 votes and, and my mate rang me on the Monday and, or the Sunday night and said, oh, look, you, you get some votes, you get 22 votes and, and um, you know, you win the brown line, you don't get three votes in the last game, and, yeah, but that never eventuated. It, it, I'm, I'm glad you told us that. <laughs> So, were you were you the subject of a plunge that year, betting plunge? I was um, sixes into five to four that Monday. Sixes into five to four. Yeah, the Mooney Valley race. That's so a plunge, mate. That's yeah, a plunge. that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Twelve months before that, in 1988, you spend four weeks in the seconds. That's right. Yeah. How'd that come about? You're 12 months shy of a Brownlow, yeah. and you're playing seconds football. Well, it's. Um, that's an interesting one. John was coaching John, John Devine. Devine. Yeah. yeah, and we had a um, we had a team meeting. You know what do they call them now? Those meetings where you talk about each other and what the leading team. Yeah, sessions, well, we, yeah. it wasn't that. John was running the show. Yeah, and players were saying, you know, we've got got to get rid of him and da 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 da. Got to get rid of John. Yeah, yeah. you know, they were behind his back. Yeah. and um, he's going through each player and asking them what their thoughts were. And he he come to me and because he was at the top of his voice, he used to get excited. You see him at <laughs> three quarter time pointing the finger. And he was a bit wound up, and he started pointing the finger at me and said, "Oh, and you don't think I can coach?" He's pointing at me quite aggressively. So I, my father always said to be honest, which has probably cost me four weeks. He said, "Look, John, I don't think you're the man for the job." Really? And when he's <laughs> <laughs> and when he's there. He said, Gavin X will sit down, which was behind him. He couldn't see Gavin, mm. but he said, does anybody else think like that? And Gavin X will stood up and he was the only bloke. And it taught me a less life lesson too, that when you're in a team, these blokes are talking about this bloke and only one bloke backed yep. me up out of the whole lot. Yep. So I knew from then, league footy's a pretty lonely world. Just were be you honest. Dropped, were you dropped instantly? Yeah, yeah, well, I got the four weeks, yeah. yeah. You know, well, probably. In the end, you can't sort of say what you want to say, but I just said it. Because yeah. I, I said to Kenny again, I said, listen, Kenny, I was, it might have been a week before or a week after, I said, listen, I'll finish up, Kenny, I've had enough, you know. At Geelong? Yeah, I said, I'll, we'll finish up. And he said to me, oh, just hang around, things might change. Mm. And that's all he said to me. And I still remember that conversation I had with him. So did you read that as Ken Gannon saying to you that there was going to be a change of coach? Yeah, yeah, yeah there was definitely. I think um, it was already in the mix of mm -hmm. all the throw of things. But I just had to speak my mind, you know, everybody else was going on about it, but, you know, and uh, so I just said it. So in comes Malcolm Jack Blight, 1989. You play grand final the first year. You play three grand finals in six and, seasons. Yeah. Yeah. And played in preliminary finals. But the first thing he changed, Michael, was the first first training session we had at uh, Eastern Beach. And the bloke who was getting a good run by John turned up late. Who was the bloke? Oh, Bruce Lindner. Bruce Lindner, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. just got back from San Fran. The president? Yeah, the yeah. president, yeah. yeah. He turned up late. And uh, so he had to get out in front of everybody and explain why he was late. So then I knew we had a chance here. Because he was a favoured son, Bruce Lynn, there, wasn't he? Oh, he was a beauty. They were telling me how good he was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Bruce. He used to, when he was going bad, Bruce, he used to wear different coloured socks mm. under John so he'd get noticed. <laughs> He goes, Bruce, he must be playing Paul. He's got the socks on. <laughs> and that's true. When you played grand finals in 92 and 94 and missed the finals yeah. in 93, what happened? Um, well, after 92, uh, Malcolm sort of changed towards us a bit. He sort of... Um, he didn't like the... Didn't like any of us, basically. <laughs> <laughs> he, he sort of seen, our, he's seen all our weaknesses and not our strengths. So he, he probably had, you know... Oh, uh, you could say he had the shits with us, I mm, suppose, you mm. could say. And well, it was because we'd lost two grand finals and he probably blamed himself, but he probably blamed us a lot more. So he played us in different spots and we had five weeks to go. And, you know, he, you could see that it was getting to Blighty, it was getting to the players, and it looked like he had a bit of a breakdown. Or well, I don't know whether he had a breakdown, but he looked in a bit of distress. And he said, oh, I've cost you the year, he said. You still have what? Cost you the year. Cost you the year. Yeah, wow. he, he was very apologetic yeah. for the year. Yeah. This is five weeks before. Um, I've done all the wrong things, basically. 
Um, and Tim Darcy piped up and said, yeah, you've cost us a year. You've cost us. Um, and he said, well, what are we going to do about it? He said, he said I apologise for it. Which is pretty mm. man, manly yep. thing to yep. do. Most coaches wouldn't do that. They'd be saying that right all the time. That was a great thing about Blighty. He, if, he, if he did something wrong, he apologised for mm-hmm. it. And you got a great respect out of that. And I respect him highly and I always have. And he said, well, we've just got to go out there, be enthusiastic. We had to play five out of the top six sides to get into the finals in 93. So... We come out, we're enthusiastic, we trained hard, he put us back in our spots and we won five out of the yeah. top six and we miss out by On percentage. percentage. Yeah. Yeah. The off-season of 1996-97, Adelaide appoints Malcolm Blight coach. You say they will win a premiership. Yeah, I actually rang um, Mark Best up and said they'll win at these blokes. They've got the side for it. All they need is um, one bloke to, to go and do it and that's Blighty. So the, ca- the coach can make that much difference, can oh, he? Oh, yeah, he can make a lot of difference. If I, only, if I got anything out of footy is that the coach reflects the players. It was interesting, when Blighty, when he came come with his Monday speech on a Monday morning, he said, oh, I think we can win, we'd get beat. If he'd come in and said, we're going to win this week, we'd win. Okay. And it's as simple as that. If I only took anything away from footy is that... The coach reflects the players. So to get into your head, to convince you... Yeah, convince you. Kenny Hinckley does it at, oh, we're the fastest side in the competition. Yeah. So they start believing at the yeah, players, yeah. Yeah. whether it's true or not. You know, it's just that positive reinforcement, we're the fastest, and he says it all the time, and I, I just giggle to myself, because mm. it's a, it's a Mel- Malcolm Blight throwaway line. Of all the unusual things that Malcolm <laughs> did... Catch is the one that lives on in your mind as the most bizarre of his... Um... Oh, the towels at the MCG. We had to bring a towel and we had to put it on our heads, like we were in a teepee, mm-hmm. and uh, little Indians, and we had a Malcolm, Big Chief Malcolm, with a peace pipe, you know, saying, me, Big Chief Malcolm, think should Billy Brown play centre half back? What do you think, little Indians? Yes, Big Chief Malcolm, you know, Billy. That's exactly how yeah, it yeah, yeah, and we'd go around, he'd go around each player, you know. Is this before a game? Before a game, yeah. Yeah, we got beat. <laughs> 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 but I, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really bag him for that because, well, he was trying something different and trying a different mindset and trying to get us to play. He'd make us, he used to make you play on edge, and that's it, when you play on, on edge. That's when you play your best. So you this this one in a kind coach, yeah. and you had a one in a kind player in in G. Abbott, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, he was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you were very close to Gaz, weren't you? Yeah, we had a lot of chats over the period of time. Um, most blokes couldn't copy, um, but we used to go to state training. You know, there's six of us, so I generally drove Gaza. Mm-hmm. The other blokes went in the other car, and we talk about a lot of things. We, and. Look, he, he had a really good thought process about his footy. He understood it very well. A lot of people wouldn't think that he just played on instinct. He didn't. And I just asked him about that the goal he kicked at Waverley. And I said, talk me through that. He said, I'll practice that move on the bus. I said, so in his, in his mind? In his mind. So he's set in his mind to, you know, balk this bloke and kick a wow. 70 metre talk. And to me, that blew me away. A lot of blokes couldn't copy. You're talking about... Yeah, that. they what just did you, what do you mean? Well, he... Because he wouldn't handball and yeah. he had a, he was different to, in that the way he trained and got away with things. But for me, I was happy for him to play because I played in a lot of grand finals. Mm-hmm. And I was lucky to play with him. But some blokes, because he didn't train much, he got away with a little bit too much. Mm-hmm. Bloody had, oh, well, we've got one special bloke here. He handled him very well, Bloody. He used to, because Bloody, I think, was a pretty special player in his yeah. own right. So he understood, understood the workings of the man. 1995, Gary Ears is your coach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know what I'm going to ask you here, dear? Oh, well, we it's uh, the eve of finals. Yeah. There's an edict that there's a compulsory Sunday morning training yeah, session, correct? That's right. We got beaten by Carlton. We, got, we were poorly beaten. And uh, he said, if anybody doesn't turn up the next day, can't, you're not, you're not, not playing, playing the, the next finals. week. Yeah, not playing the next week. Anyway, Gaz had been on a bit of a... Sort of a, he had a bit of a drink. You call him a bender? Yeah, he had a bit yeah. of a bender, yeah. yeah. And um, so I ne- lived next door to him a couple of hundred metres away. So I knew. It's a big property next door. Well, <laughs> well I, knew he'd been str- <laughs> I knew he was struggling, and, um, you know, just mentally. And, and uh, so I went over that morning, that Sunday morning, 
and um, I was a little bit worried about him, so I went and little Gazza was there and said, oh, where's the big fella? And he said, oh, he's down in the bedroom. And uh, so I went down and uh, I shook him to wake him up, thinking I'd woken him up enough. I said, oh, come on, Gaz, we're going to go to training. Mm. You know, we've got to get you there. And uh, he didn't turn up till very, very late and was too late. Uh, what I should have done is jumped in the, got him in the car yep. and took him with me. I didn't think, I thought I'd woken him up enough. Yep. He went back to sleep, didn't turn up. So as he said, he's not playing. But it was a coaching edict, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Don't turn up, don't play. Yeah, he, yeah. he probably shouldn't have played. But for me, I was a bit selfish because I wanted him to play because yeah. he had a chance of winning. Yeah. If you haven't got Gazza in there, it's a bit hard to... So he ended up playing couch. Yeah. Him. So what happened? Who changed Ezzy's mind? Well, I think the uh, committee did. I think uh, Ron and then said, look... Ron yeah, Harvey? Yeah, yeah, well, I think he did. I'm not quite sure. I don't know <laughs> it. So. And, um, yeah, I think he, he, he did... Uh, well, he changed, they made him change his mind and Gazza played. He didn't play well, uh, but, you know... Does it undermine the coach's authority when the committee comes in and sort of says, mate, this is Gary Ablett we're talking about here, he's yeah, got to play. I think it does, yeah. I think it does undermine it. You know, when you look back on it, it you know, at the time I wanted him to play, mm. so <laughs> undermine or nothing, I just wanted him to play. <laughs> it's still, you know, respected Ezzy, but I could see where his point was, Ezzy, that he got undermined from it. You you and Ezzy weren't close, were you? Oh, well, I, we, I played under him for a few years, yeah. No, we look, Look, I respect um, Ezzy as a player. I think he was a fantastic player. Do you respect him as a coach? Oh, well, he, he, he did a reasonable sort of job. Yeah, no, I couldn't say yes. Is short answer no? <laughs> <laughs> I do respect him, but, you know, he wasn't one of my better coaches, let's put okay. it that way. Grand final day 1995. I don't know if you know this. One of your mates said that you blew up at halftime against Carlton. You're playing Carlton, you're down, yeah. and you went crazy in the rooms at halftime. Oh, I was a bit angry at, in the 10 minute mark of the first quarter, Mike. You know, they were shredding us to pieces. You've got to make changes. Just put them in an awkward spot. And we weren't doing it. And we were getting flogged. And anyway, I was getting angry and angry. And uh, it'd been... Because I'd lost three grand finals. Mm. And it was looking pretty ordinary. Because this was probably your last crack, isn't it? It was. Yeah. You know, we come in half time. I was pretty steamed up. And Paul Armstrong was the footy manager at the mm. time. So I was... <laughs> so I grabbed him by the throat and nearly put him up Literally? against... Literally? Yeah, I grabbed him by the throat. Yeah. I said, listen... I don't know what you're doing up there, but it ain't working. Not in those words. I was pretty angry. I said yeah. a few things. I said, we need to man up. I said, let's change the game around. Their, their kick-outs, we can't touch it. And I was, had a few more words. I said, if, if you don't change it, I'm not going out there. I'm going to get embarrassed. Like, I am embarrassed now, but I'm not going out to play. So anyway, he come back and said, yeah, they've made the decision to go man on man. So now third quarter come, Buddha forgets to pick up Bradley. So they get the first kick out. Second kick out, we actually were competitive. We actually got the ball back in. I think we kicked a point. From then on, the game started to get on even terms. But we weren't on even terms mm. in the first half. Your connections with a club that's recently won three flags and has been one of the great teams in footy history. Are you jealous? Uh, if they'd won it in 97, I would have been jealous. You know, missed out all those years. But no, I was, I was wrapped for them. Absolutely, generally but, you know, I, I know, Of course you rap for them. Yeah, oh, I wasn't Because you're a long legend. But I mean, do you feel um, like sometimes blokes are just born in the wrong generation, aren't they? They are. You know, you are. Like, um, we had 12 or 13 very good players, but mm. we didn't have a full list. You know, for them in 07 to rock up against Port Adelaide, <laughs> yep. which I rated probably 10th or 12th side yeah, in the yep. competition. And uh, if Gaz had played on Wakeley, he might have kicked 14. But... <laughs> <laughs> I but, like Darrell Wakeland. <laughs> I probably do too, yeah. but Gaza still would have kicked 14 on yeah. it. You played 18 finals, Couchy. 18. Yeah. And averaged, I think, 23 possessions. You could find the footy, couldn't you? Well, uh, that, was my, that was my job, really. And uh, Blighty said to me, after we lost the 89 grand final, we need you to be in the top three in the finals for us to win it. So he put the heat on me a bit. Mm. But, yeah, no, I had to win the ball. You know, just go and play. Like I say to my kids, if you're going to get nervous, you might as well sit with me. You just really? Go, yeah, you just but, how, go. but how can you tell? How can you make your body not be nervous? Just concentrate on the ball. Are oh, you talking about when the game's on? Yeah, when the okay. game's on, just okay. concentrate on the ball. You can't, you can't do anything during the week. When you when you get there, you just got to concentrate on the ball. You know what you, you know what you're going to do. You know what the opposition are going to do. So it's just a message, reading the ball, watching the ball. I used to do the tapes on the centre bounces. 
throw-ins more than anybody else mm -hmm. when I was playing. So I had an understanding of what the opposition were doing and what I was what, what I was doing, basically. That 94 grand final. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You played West Coast. Yeah, yeah. They were big boys, weren't they? Oh, they were massive. From 92 to 94, they just, yeah, they had muscles on their muscles and I couldn't believe how big they were. And um, I remember, this is true, I was the half time of sort of going off the ground. I see the little league roll onto the ground. <laughs> and I'm going, I should be here with these blokes. Really? So, no, then I could get a kick. That's how big so they were. So they were that big? Oh, yeah. I thought I was playing in Little League. I was, it was out of my league. They were just so big. Were you surprised how big they'd become in, in, a, a, in a relatively short period? Oh, I was. You know, they were, they were massive. You know, Jakovic and Main wearing they, they got pumped right up. I don't know what they were on. They were good stakes over there. Good stakes? Yeah, yeah I reckon. Yeah. yeah OK. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I was out of my league. <laughs> so. I talked about your best and fairest. So I want to ask you about the third one. 1995 was your third, mm. correct? Yep. Yeah. Gary Ablett had a big year in 95. Yeah, massive. Missed a couple of games through suspension. I think that might have helped you win the BNF, did it? Yeah, we're playing. Um, we're playing the Bulldogs, and Alan Joyce, I think, was coaching the Bulldogs mm -hmm. down at Kenya Park, and they certainly targeted me. Like, I think um, they the photo showed. Oh well, a lot of the Bulldogs halfback. What players. the so-called at the time Wog Squad? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's what I think they called. Yeah, that's right. Up. Yeah, they they were um, into me from the first bounce, and they were scratching and biting and pulling me and doing all sorts of stuff. And Gazza was full forward. I was playing on the half forward flank. And he was getting a bit upset for it. Because he me. could see it happening? He could see it happening, yeah. They were getting right into me. Anyway, um, he said to me, Cadgy, just when you get down to the forward line, you know, you're playing half forward flank, just float down to the full forward and uh, I'll sort these blokes out. Anyway, so I sort of float down, down to the forward pocket and the blokes are still chasing me. Who yeah. were you playing on, Paul? Oh, uh, Collinook, I think I was. I'm not quite sure. Stephen Collinook? Yeah, I think it was one of the... He apologised after. Mm. And um, so I'm floating down in the forward pocket. Then I could see Gazza out of the corner of my eye, <laughs> come with Stevens straight at uh, Rowan Smith. And uh, it was like a train, freight train going mm. past, and he's just cleaned up Rowan Smith and knocked him out. Cost him two weeks. And the BNF. Uh, yeah. He was a dangerous man, Gazza. He knocked out a lot of people. He did. He did. Tell me the story. Is it fact or fiction about your father, Billy? Did he lose? He blew his hand off. He blew his hand yeah, off. Yeah, he blew his hand off with an uh, overloaded shot, shotgun. Yeah. Um, now, literally blew his hand off. Blew his hand off. There was a bit of skin yeah. uh, holding the hand together. Yeah. Um, he had up to his face, he said. And then he put it down and blew his hand off. Wow. I mean, he still had the gun, it was a oh, double barrel shotgun, and it split like that. So he was lucky to live anyway. He had seven kids. So. Yeah. And uh, look. But didn't he, how, how soon after that did he play? He, he played Hamden League footy, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. He was a very good player. And he, I think he played oh, three or four months after blowing his hand off. Wow. And he played with blood soaked uh, bandages, and he'd play and he adjusted his hand so he could mark the ball. Play with a broken leg once. And Did he? And he, he actually played a game against Naranda. Naranda South, they were uh, pretty combatants, you know, like they, were, they didn't like each other. Mm. They were local footy. And uh, I come in, I was milking the cows, and he come in, and he had a big split in his hand. This is how tough he was. He said, uh, I knocked out four, but the fifth one, I've, I've got his teeth and split my hand open. <laughs> I said, you silly bugger, what are you doing? I think he was about 40 at the time. Oh, no. And uh, no, he split his hand and he knocked out four, five blokes. Did he really? And In a pub fight or something? No, no, I was playing a game of footy. Oh, playing, playing yeah, footy. Yeah, yeah. And um, he got penicillin to heal it up because that's what he did. They put some dust. Well, his hand, his arm was like that. And he, look, he was extraordinarily tough. And I don't know that, but I was only been by folklore. Yeah. He played with 13 league footballers. At Warrnambool, he was probably the best player. Really? He actually had a game with South Melbourne. All he had to do was turn up. Mm. He didn't turn up. His father said, you leave the farm, that's it. In those days, it was pretty hard. Life's tough at Boggy Creek, is it? Oh, yeah, you've got to earn your stripes. Yeah. Now, your boy Tom. You, your roles are reversed. You, were, you were missed an early opportunity when you were a teenager yeah. and thought it might be over. How difficult was it watching Tom sort of crave for his chance at AFL level and, and have to wait so oh, long? As a parent, it's probably not what I did. It was pretty tough, yeah. Because he just loved the footy. He, mm. he wore out the 89 state game 
Pacific versus South Australia. He just well, he watched it over and over again. He just loved his footy. Mm. He'd be out kicking the footy all the time. If I wasn't there, he'd be getting his granddad out there to play and have a kick. So it was pretty tough. Early on, he wasn't uh, a really good player, but he used to stand in the right spots. You know, he was a young kid, pretty light. Then after a while, he, he started to get it all together and had a crack. He had his opportunity with um, Melbourne. Melbourne, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty tough seeing him go through it because he just wanted to play league footy yep. like any kid. And you'll see that, you know, with the TAC Cup, kids just want to play footy. And uh, so, unfortunately, you know, he played a couple of years at Melbourne, didn't get a great did opportunity. Get a fair, did, you, yeah, I was gonna, did he get a fair crack at it? Well, they played really well some games at Casey in the reserves. And when you, you play somebody, you play them at, when they're at their best. And sometimes I thought he might get a game and didn't get a game. Mm. Then when he did get a game, he was probably at his tightest. Mm. So he wasn't at his best to play because at a, a late pre-season, his first year was very good. And he could have, I thought he might have played a game in the MCG because it was nice and wet, you know, and they probably needed a player like him to play that day. And no, he missed his opportunity, really. Mm. Your role as a Garbo. Gary Hocking did it, you did it. Yeah. Why were you a Garbo? Well, I just, no real reason. It was just to, to get fit. It was, uh, it was yeah. fitness driven, was it? Fitness driven, basically, yeah. yeah. I wasn't to do anything else. Like. So you'd run the roads and did you yeah. literally pick the bins up? Oh, we picked them up. We used to stack them up and rack them up, yeah. yeah. We, it was amazing. Like, I'd train on a Wednesday night, be very sore, really sore the next morning, Thursday morning. And the bloke was a Russian who was driving, and if I was slow, he didn't like that. Yeah. So he'd go faster in front of you, he'd yeah. go in front of you, so you had to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> so about half an hour, what, I'd, after half an hour, I'd loosen up and get going. Really good for freeing up your body and going really? again. I used to run oh, 8 to 10K on a Friday. And not, Did you really? And think about Saturday, like if I could run 12, 8 to 10K on a Friday, how are they going to stop me on a Saturday? Mm. But so your that, mindset's good. But is that a good prep to run 8 or 10 Ks on the roads on a Friday? the day before a game? Never worried me. Just never worried, never worried you. Yeah, no, you just keep going. Hey, mate, great career. Thanks. Look, uh, um, <laughs> well, no, it was an outstanding career. Lots yeah, of thanks, games, man. lots of... Uh, it's just I, I'm sure that there's a hole in your CV with no premierships, but yeah. you're entirely really proud of what you've done, and we love watching you play, Couchy. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Good on you. Cheers.